What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheehan Show here on Sherdog.com. My name is Sean Sheehan, and today I am back with a recap of PFL to 2024 uh, obviously is the name uh, gives away it's the second uh, edition of the PFL season for the year 2024 and we had um, a really 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 good card there was, there was a lot of odd incidents but there was a lot of great knockouts and some very good fights as well honestly the whole night was, was brilliant we had the uh, the 205 pounders uh, which is obviously light heavyweight division and 115 uh, 55 pounders even the lightweight division uh, up here and I'll tell you what it was it was brilliant from start to finish uh, often I'd be sitting there and I'd be you know I'd be, t- I'd be taking my notes and I'm watching the fights in the background although when I'm doing this I'm obviously taking very uh, <laughs> very stringent notes because I've talked through all the fights but there wasn't one second where like you know, you were kind of, oh, this fight isn't great. This fight is kind of, you know, ebbing along. Okay, I won't have to take too much notes for that because I can just say, oh, well, that wasn't great. Every single fight, like, we went from two finishes at the very start to a good fight in the decision to three more finishes uh, in a row to a mad injury to, uh, <laughs> you know, more finishes on the main card. Uh, there was only, I believe, only one. Was that one decision in the whole night? Let me just check here again. Yeah, I believe only one decision all night, uh, and a fantastic car, and you couldn't ask for better from PFL. And like, um, it's interesting that you know P- PFL have become uh, look. They, they talk about themselves as, as the co leader, as we all know, but without a shadow of a doubt, they are PFL slash Bellator. I suppose what it is now is the the one who's chasing the UFC, whether they're a close number two or a distant number two, we can decide that for ourselves, or maybe the uh, the future will decide that as well. But um, I uh, what what I I think they showed tonight, and what they I hope they will continue to show, is that the addition of the Bellator fighters with the PFL fighters have made their cards a whole different ball game. They've made them way more interesting uh, in terms of, of breaking them down beforehand, which I, I always do, obviously, as you know, uh, in the fights as well. But also, like, for, okay, I, I picked two betting picks for this card and got them both wrong. But there, why, why is that? Uh, well, because I'm bad at picking bets, <laughs> one. But the other side of it is we don't have, like, a direct reference some t- to, to a lot of these fights. Because I, I was talking about the heavyweights last, uh, uh, last week, and it's very interesting with heavyweight because the heavyweights... The heavyweights tend to fight more at the very top, and there's lots of, uh, uh, and there isn't that many of them, so they fight each other all the time. So we kind of have a reference for there's a lot of rematches, or this lad fought two of the same opponents that the other lad fought. But now that they're coming over from different promotions to fight each other, that reference really isn't there. Like there's, there, you know, every fighter might, uh, I, I say, let's, let's say on the old PFL cards, or more so even the old Bellator cards, or let's say the UFC even at the top of the division. You might have two, three people in common with your opponent coming up in those sort of fights. But now it's it's almost none. And that makes these fights way harder to predict. And unpredictable fights is exactly what we want in mixed martial arts. That's what we crave. That's what we need. Uh, and like MMA is a pretty unpredictable sport in itself. Add another bit of unpredictability into it. Didn't add lots of finishes like this and all. And you have... Uh, a recipe for absolute success. Um, now, getting people to tune in and getting people to talk about it and all is a different kettle of fish. I did think there was more um, uh, on uh, for the second event than there was for the first. And uh, we'll talk about it. I'll have the preview for next week coming up as well soon. I'll talk more about it there. But um, I, I think this is a good sign. If you're someone watching this and you didn't check out, check out the show or whatever, I think now is really the time to get in on the PFL and Bellator watching because it's... It's very fun. Even like, okay, last week's wasn't the most amazing card ever, but it was still the new matchups, the way Moldovsky came out and fought like that. I, uh, do you know what? And uh, Another interesting thing is, well, maybe I'll talk about it when we get to the Brim Primus fight. The different ways that people approach the PFL season and the different ways they're fighting them, I, I'm fascinated by that because it's the sort of thing you, you know, maybe, maybe after these three events, maybe I'll go back and I'll do like a recap of that and maybe talk about the tactics maybe of it or talk about it on one of the, the next shows or maybe the, the final show I do because I find that really, really interesting and captivating to see how different fighters approach the, the, the season and see like 
do I go all out and try to get the first round knockout take a lot of shots and I'll get through it or do I try to keep it safe maybe try to go to a decision uh, so I can be fit to fight the next day and then I might have a bit more of a break after that maybe I can go for it in that one I'll have a different opponent or something. I, I just find it all very fascinating but anyway that's maybe a bigger discussion uh, for a future although maybe maybe we'll talk more about it now anyway let's get straight into it here and I'm going to go from the main event and we got all the way down through it although in this one it's funny it, it's a little bit you know obviously UFC 300 uh, maybe by the time uh, you're listening to this it might already have happened but um, there, the UFC 300 card is very good from the opening bout till the last bout and it's funny with the PFL because of all the um, you know the, the seasonal matchups it's kind of the same right there's probably three or four fights in this card that could have been the main event and that's that's not saying oh PFL have like 10 main events in their cards but all the the matchmaking is usually very kind of even, you know, and um, that again another reason. I feel like I'm I feel like I'm promoting I'm promoting PFL here, but I, I don't know. I just really I, I actually really do uh, enjoy watching these PFL cards, even though I'm sitting here at four forty two a.m. and I have to be up in in five hours. I still enjoy it. I don't care. I, I can't help it. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the main event: uh, Impa Kasang and I versus Alex Pelizzi, which was an absolute banger for as long as that lasted and uh, it ended in 3.29 of the uh, of the first round um, I I'll tell you what Alex Polizzi came out here and he he didn't, do you know what, he didn't come out here to lose he very very much didn't come out here to lose whatsoever he put it on Kisangani he tried his best to answer Kisangani's punches, his shots, he tried to take him down, he tried he tried, he tried, he tried, and he tried, and it didn't work out for him, and it went very badly for him very quickly. But I respect Alex Pelizzi. He's a good fighter. Obviously, you know, I fought uh, my countryman, Carl Moore, before, and I covered that fight uh, in depth at the time as well. And I kind of, you know, you look at a guy like that, and you think, man, you know, he was probably ranked number six in the world at the time in, in the Bellator rankings, which I actually think are gone, which is unfortunate. But um, he uh, he maybe didn't have, like, the... Um, you know, maybe he didn't have the recognition that a lot of the guys have uh, in uh, in that weight class, or a lot of guys have at at two or five in general uh, outside of the Bellator even. Uh, but I think he, uh, I think he deserves it. I think he's a very good fighter, and this was a, a very interesting fight. Let me let me turn off my let me turn off my heater here as I bite to that. Right, let's get into the fight. Um, round one, you know what I mean? Round round uh, one, one round even, but uh, it started out with a big right hand from Imp and a lovely shot, uh, and then they both. Uh, were throwing calf kicks. The first two were landed by Alex Pelizzi. <coughs> um, he wanted well, actually, he landed one calf kick, and then he wanted, landed one higher leg kick. I don't know what you'd even call them now. They were just the the regular leg kicks before the uh, the tie kicks. Let's put it that way. The knee just above the knee kicks. Um, Impa went for a takedown when Alex came in. Then, but I, it was more kind of on retrospect based on what happened in the rest of the uh, of the fight. I think it was. Uh, Alex Pelizzi, I, I, I have a tendency to call him Alex just because of Alex Pereira. <laughs> but no, Alex, Alex. Um, it, it was because he was trying to come in and he was trying to clinch up, but at the time it was like, oh, who actually kind of went for that? Who caused that? But it was def- definitely uh, Pelizzi. Uh, but he got straight up and he tried for a takedown himself then, uh, but imp- again got on top. So two kind of grappling attempts from Pelizzi, both quickly went wrong and Impa Kasang and I won both of them um, but from that he also got back up uh, he went for another takedown which went into the clinch and then there was some lovely ground scrambles Polizzi kind of lifted Impa up um, and um, wasn't able to keep him on the ground it went into a clinch and uh, uh, Polizzi had that kind of low clinch takedown attempt you know the one where they're kind of shoving their head into the ground and the two hands are out it, uh, the ones that rarely work to be honest but um, he was holding that for a while Broke out and then he got dropped hard twice with shots. Um, the legs looked like they were gone after. I believe one was a big, uh, it was a right hand left hook, I think. Uh, but he kept moving. Um, he was grabbing onto ankles, uh, really surviving. Mark Goddard, I think, did a great job in both this part of the fight and the finish as well. Could have really been stopped there if you'd kind of panic, but I think by letting it go, Goddard did the right thing. Because Pelizzi kept fighting, you know, he went on, he looked for an, um, a knee bar, he almost got it, you know, he was in the knee bar, but uh, and I got out, so he was definitely still striking, but they got back up, and Impa just opened up and smashed him, uh, he, um, Pelizzi backed up, 
you could see that there was no one at home when he backed up and Mark Goddard jumped in without letting him take another shot. Absolutely brilliant ref and saved him from uh, from plenty of damage that he absolutely didn't need there. So a great win for Ibex. Do you know exactly what he needed here as well? You know what did he? What damage did he take? Or nothing really. He got you know a few takedown attempts, a few leg kicks. Nothing major there at all. Although you never know with leg kicks, but uh, especially coming off that Johnny Eblen tough war after having what was it six fights last year? Was it to be coming into the uh, season again this year? I'm sure he really didn't need uh, a war in this one, and he got a bit of a war, but he was on. Uh, he was the hammer more than the nail in this one, and he did a great job and a great win. And again, in Bikazang and I, the star of PFL now, it's hard to say he isn't really the absolute star of the last, what, 18 months of PFL. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant stuff from uh, from Bikazang and I. And he goes on. I'm looking forward to seeing who he make, meets next. Uh, I, I don't know if they mentioned it or not who he's fighting next because. Uh, as as you can tell by the by the time I, I kind of rushed out to record this afterwards, so maybe that will be announced by the time this video comes out too. Come in event then we had Rob Wilkinson versus Tom Breeze again. I thought this might have been the main event. I think I even said it last week maybe, but um, both fights went pretty similarly in in terms of it was a good back and forth exchange, and then one guy won. Uh, I think Pelizzi was a lot harder of an out than Tom Breeze, if you want to put it that way, um, and. It's difficult with Tom Breeze because, you know, I think Tom, Tom is one of these guys who has it all, right? He he has the striking, he has the grappling, uh, the, the wrestling, the whole lot. He has absolutely everything, but he's just not able to put it together. Now, is it one of these things where he's an athlete and not a fighter? Uh, or is it like completely mental? I think it's a bit of both. Um... Or, you know, athlete, not a fighter, in fair, maybe a martial artist and not a fighter. He just doesn't have that. I don't know if it's toughness or just the ability to take a shot, or it's the once you take one shot, you just mentally go. Because, look, it's the mentality that's been the issue with Tom Breeze before. He's had to pull out of fights before because of, you know, these kind of mental state backstage and things like that. Um, and that, you know, sometimes we see it in fights. What was that one fight? If I can, uh, if I can pull it up here, where he was in the UFC and he, you know, it was a fight he'd absolutely no business losing. Uh, I, I was it the Amari Ekmadov fight. Uh, I, t I think it might have been like where he just kind of curled up and that was that. Uh, it just that happens to him sometimes. It really does. And I, I think it's reached a stage now where it's just, it's never going to be it for Tom Breeze. You know, like Breeze should be. Breeze is good enough to be the guy like Rob Wilkinson. I truly believe that. Like, I think Breeze is good enough to be a top five fighter in the UFC. I really do. I think he has that much skill and ability. But it's not just about that. If you don't have it all, like, I, I'm always saying it, like, the, uh, you know, the, the Darren Elkins factor, the durability. If you do not have the durability, whether, you know, physical I usually talk about, but mental as well. If you don't have it, you'll never get there. Um, and... The vast majority of people don't have it. It's just very unusual for someone to get to this position without having or which are struggling in that way. And I don't I'm not I don't like to be too harsh on him or anything, but when you kind of see it unfurled here before the world, it's you know, to be wrong, I suppose not to talk about the facts of the matter, like, you know. Um but as I said, Tom Breeze will win ninety percent of his fights. Like, you know, maybe not ninety percent, but you know, eighty percent of his fights. But when he gets to someone like Rob Wilkinson, who is tough and who's done it at, at a very high level, uh, it's it's going to be an issue. So this fight, they both jabbed early. And I would say, so it was literally jab, jab. And I would say, if you were to give, if you were to give the jabs, right, a, uh, a score out of 10 with how hard they were, you give Wilkinson's jab, let, let's say you give Wilkinson's jab a, a 6, and you'd give Breeze's jab an 8, right? So Breeze hit him harder with the jab. And the reaction of both of them, you'd give Wilkinson's reaction maybe a four, and you'd give Breeze's reaction probably a ten. Ten to the five and four to the eight. That if you get where I'm on there, right? I might have gone insane there. I need like the if there, if I had someone editing this to put like the you know the Zach Galifianakis gift over it. Anyway, just. I, I genuinely, from the first two shots of the fight, I was like, oh no, this is not going to go well. Uh, and it didn't. Um, 
Wilkinson just immediately started to land better. But Breeze, he landed some lovely dirty box and landed a huge uppercut on Wilkinson as well. And I was thinking, like, it, <coughs> the only way Tom Breeze was winning that fight was if he knocked Wilkinson out first. That was the only way it was happening, but it didn't. Uh, Rob Shots just seemed to immediately hurt him. Landed those shoulders, landed those knees, landed that uppercut, did Wilkinson. Breeze fell. Um, the referee stopped it. And uh, that was that. They're, like, they were kind of looking for shots. But e- every time Wilkinson hit him, if he hit him once more, you could have, you could see the knees going of Breeze toppling to the ground and just one or two more and it's over. That was coming. It was If he hadn't knocked out Wilkinson, that was, that was just what was happening. And uh, that's what exactly what did happen. And it was a good, great finish for uh, for Rob Wilkinson. Really good stuff there. It's it's weird. I, I concentrated on the two losing um, fighters, I suppose, in the top two more so. But uh, I I think that, although I didn't really maybe in the middle of it, but in this like I, I feel I feel like that kind of is a story with Tom Breeze. For Rob Wilkinson, he goes on, and um, yeah, the, I think a big talking point in that as well was there was a hot mic left on in the middle of the fight, and. Uh, Sean O'Connell said, should I ask Rob Wilkinson about his drugs uh, or about his steroids? Which, obviously, Rob Wilkinson last year was uh, was out of the tournament and he had a no contest because he was caught with, along with, what, seven more? Taking, uh, t- six more, I think, uh, taking uh, steroids. So, yeah, that's not a good look. There's a lot of hot mics going around for PFL, so that's something they definitely need to uh, improve on. But I... Like, I spoke about it last week, like, the production for PFL, and I saw a lot of people kind of giving out about it. I, like, I genuinely think they have gotten better now. Obviously, that's a big error, and there were one or two other things, but I do think, that I stand by what I said last week, I do think the production has gotten a lot better. Is it perfect? Absolutely not yet, but, um, you know, this was this was tough. This was tough. Um, the next fight in, Clay Collar versus Patricky Pitbull. My, my fight of the night, and uh, coming into it, and it was definitely the fight of the night, on the night, um, what a fight! Clay Collar Patricky to again the merger. This fight couldn't happen. One we never thought of, but one when you do think of it, is like, well, that's going to be brilliant, and it was. Uh, so let's run through it. Calf kicks and a right hand from Patricky Ch- Pitbull started it off. Another right hand from uh, Pitbull, who was circling and doing very well. Great start from Patricky. Both landed calf kicks. Clay was kind of pushing the pace, but that's. What Patricky wants, you know, the Pitbull brothers love when the opponents push the pace and they can land counters. It was some lovely two straight, one left and one right from Clay Collard, which he is very good at. We t- I talked about that last week. Both landed. And then Patricky dropped him hard. Exactly again what I talked about last week. My my, my analysis for this was good. My pick was bad. <laughs> That's the only thing. I, I, I And I always say that. I love doing the analysis, but I don't like doing the pick. Um, but I haven't watched it back again. Um... He dropped him hard, but I think Clay wasn't as hurt, maybe, as it seemed initially. Um, Patricky went at him. He got a takedown after he landed a good few shots. Clay got up. Uh, they had lovely exchanges. Clay's cutting off the cage very well. Boat landed leg kicks. Uh, Clay landed a hard body shot then. And I think Patricky from that stage kind of... Not, not that he wilted a bit, but he, he was getting a little bit more tired, and that body work really did start to add up. Uh, Patricky did did land a lovely left hook and right hand and a an knee, uh, but Clay finished very well. Lovely fast hand flurry, great round, great round. Could have gone either way, really. It was it was weird because like Trout almost Trout the whole first round and bit of the second round. It was really Clay Collard winning most of it, and then Patricky kind of hitting him hard, you know. And uh, that was really the story of the first. Started started around two. Clay looked much fresher. Uh, Patricky was falling into uh, to shots. Uh, Clay uh, was landing lots of shots. The uh, the counter from Patricky was still coming, but it wasn't landing with the same fizz in it as it was in the first. Um, um, and then you could see the tired was coming, and Clay Collard saw it too. Just up the pace and did it at a, in a really smart way, where he was landing shots from kind of his range not getting caught by the counters that were were coming, but not coming, as I said, with the same phase in them that they did again, plus not kind of getting caught up in his own work either, where, you know, you get closer and you get so close it turns into a clinch. He didn't do that. Um, and Keith Peterson, after a good barrage of shots, came in and stopped the fight. I thought it was a great stoppage, to be honest. I really, really, uh, I really liked this. I saw some people online saying it was a bad stoppage that Patricky was still throwing. I understand that, but when... 
He is throwing, nothing is coming from him. He's throwing and then nothing is landing and then he kind of half stopped throwing. If that happens and the opponent is still throwing loads of shots, uh, I think that's a fair I think that's fair game at that stage and I think that's a fair time to stop it and I think it was uh, the right time to stop it and I, I give Keith Peterson all the credit credit for that actually i don't know i think it was that fight where Keith peterson was like walking towards the cameras they introduced him and someone, someone from the crowd just just shouts we love you Keith peterson <laughs> which uh only Keith peterson wouldn't have laughed at i think so fair play to them uh probably the biggest shock of the night then came after that as michael dufour as after i called him michael dufour last week i didn't i just went and watched a couple of his fights i didn't realize he was <laughs> french canadian or whatever so um he beat Mads Burnell and a look. Mads is one of those guys who he doesn't always he doesn't always do himself the favors that he should. Right, I feel like he wants to please the crowd. He wants to have the fight that he wants to have rather than having a winning fight, and that's <clears throat> you know it's not smart to be honest. If you want to be a winning fighter, if you want to win a season, if you want to win a million, um, and. I feel like that's kind of what happened here, but all credit to, to Dufort, he's stuck in there. It's hard to watch that first round and not think that Mads Burnell is a better fighter than him, or most of the fight, to be honest. Like, I think Mads Burnell was just a little bit better in all fronts, but he lost the fight, you know, and that's that's the, the, the top and bottom of it. So let's run through it. Uh, Mads ended a calf kick to start it off. Uh, Dufour went for the takedown, uh, didn't get it. Mads was pushing at a, a mad pace. Dufort was uh, throwing a lot, but missing a lot. A uh, lot of calf kicks for Mads early. I think he landed 11 calf kicks in the first two or three minutes of the fight. A lot a lot landed altogether. Mads with these kind of high hands blocking everything. Dufour was, was throwing but not landing. But then in maybe the mid part of the round, he landed three lovely right hands uh, after missing so many. Uh, and they, they, could ha- they had an impact on Mads. You could see it. So at that point, you're kind of thinking to yourself, right, Mads, you're really good on the ground. He's trying to take you down. You're an unbelievable submission artist. Get the fight to the ground. Let him go for a takedown. Let him even take you down and work from the bottom, or like just do what happened in the in the police game fight. Like, you know, <sighs> let him go for the takedown. Turn his weight against him. Take him down. You land on top. But no, he didn't. Uh, he just kept striking. Landed some left hooks. Um, Dufort was kind of very square and like very open to shots, and that allowed Mads Burnell to land some lovely body shots. There was a nice knee by Dufour. Um, Mads landed a lovely combo, and then there was that switch knee from Dufour. He threw that a couple of times, kind of half landed it. Landed two more after that, and then a lovely spinning fist. And those were kind of, I think, a little bit of a turning point in the fight. Both landed hard late, but you could see Mads Burnell maybe wasn't in, as in control defensively and just out of the fight as a whole from that point on uh mad started dancing at the start of the second round there was actually there was a couple of slaps at the end of the first round as well uh but anyway uh then they went to war uh do for landon um landed something that hurt mad still not 100 percent sure but it was even on the replay it was hard to see mad's is backing up at a red and knots landed a body kicked in uh, and i think that made me think it was a rib so i think it was a rib do for uh got the fight to the ground uh, guillotined, mounted guillotine Mads and Mads tapped very quick <sighs> he's a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt he's not tapping to a mounted guillotine like that that quickly so he must have been hurt something definitely happened there but um, look honestly and this is a weird thing to say but I think it was going that way um, I think the way Mads Brunel was fighting was not smart even though he was winning up until that point um, I think it was he was winning until he was losing to be honest and uh, Dufour was a, a tough guy and kept coming and uh, and won the fight fair and square. So uh, fair play to him and a good win there for him. Um, we had another kind of injury finish here, although that one wasn't an injury finish per se, but uh, Sadabu C and Josh Silvera. This one only went, uh, let me just check here how long did it go. Let me check up uh, this beautiful website called Sherdog.com. It went 74 seconds or 1 minute 14 uh, of the first round. Um, jo- uh, Joshua was pushing the pace. Sadabu C was throwing his jabs and his leg kicks. Joshua, uh, Joshua Silvera got in in the single. So just kind of just getting into it there, gets the takedown. And as he gets the takedown, uh, Sadabu C landed on his thumb. And I don't know, did it dislocate it or just broke it in half or whatever it was. But a really bad thumb injury. Uh, he called the referee. The referee came, I think it was, uh, it was uh, Mark Goddard, I think. Uh, and obviously stopped the fight. Um straight away see i asked for the fight to be stopped basically so very very unfortunate but look 
Joshua Severa picked him up and he, he he put him down on the ground. And if you, you put someone down hard enough and they get hurt, that's uh, a genuine way to win the fight. So cr- credit to Joshua Silveri there. Unfortunate, but I, I, those ones I don't think people get enough credit. Like, it's funny because you look at Joshua Silveri, maybe it's not up necessarily on the... Um, uh, on the method of victory, but he's won, I, I think, at least one fight uh, like this before. Yeah, uh, against Dylan Monta, he picked him up and he injured his knee when he put him down. And I think he, in, I, I'm pretty sure he injured someone's like ribs or something as well uh, when he put him down once. So this is not, you know, this is not, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it happens when you're fighting like someone like Silvera. It also happens when you're going up from welterweight to light heavyweight and there's a big strong guy lifting you up and fecking you around the place, you know. So uh, credit to Joshua Silvera, I think, unlucky for Sadabu C, but look, these things happen in MMA. Uh, we had Antonio Carlos Jr. ring and Simon Biong. And if you listen to Betting Show, I told you Biong was not without a chance here. And I, about five seconds into the fight, I was like, "Oh my god!" Because um, both uh, Biong landed two leg kicks, and then he absolutely rattled him on a jab. Now, when I say rattled him, whew, shoe face his head just went boom back. It was like he was in a car crash. And I was thinking here, if Biong can land some shots. We're in trouble here if we're Antonio Carlos Jr. Um, but he couldn't. Um, uh, Antonio Carlos Jr. came in with a single leg, gets it to the clinch against the cage, hand locked. But Biong defends, defends well, uh, got the underhook. Carlos moved around to the back, though. Really, really, really smart. He kind of allowed Biong to move. Then he moved around, as I said, to the back against the cage. Uh, tra- you know, Transitioned around that way and then tripped him. And got the fight uh, on the ground with two minutes left. Genius stuff there against a younger guy. Uh, a bigger, stronger, harder hitter. Just brilliant stuff. Uh, landed some left hands when he had the back. Into the body triangle. Went for the rear naked choke. Not right. Kind of moved around. Rear naked choke, choke again. We kind of the, the straight hand. Now, jiu-jitsu people will be able to explain this better than me. But John, we often see the rear naked choke where it's kind of the V, you know, uh, one arm, uh, the, you know, the... The forearm at this side and the top of the arm, whatever that's like, the bicep at the other side. His was just forearm straight across it. So this was more like a, um, uh, an air choke than a blood choke, I think. Um, so yeah, now there's my there's my there's my jujitsu expertise for one day going in there from watching all the the Tyree Atola fights and all like pure jujitsu expert now. But yes, he he uh, it doesn't matter anyway. He choked him and he tapped him uh, and that was that. So the, the former champ Antonio Carlos Jr. set. You know, set a pace here, and it'll be interesting to see uh, who who he draws next. Four minutes, four, thirty-four seconds uh, into round one. There was another round one finish before that. Bit of a shock as well in my books, but it was all just a bit too soon for Jacob. Uh, and though, um, I, I I just think a little bit foolhardy with the game plan here as well. Um, so uh, Yaksha Mordov uh, won in the first round. Um, Yaksha Mordov came out and landed some leg kicks. Uh, and I just looked rushed from the very start. Uh, he landed a left hook, but it was countered by the right hand. Uh, Yaksha Mordov landed more leg kicks again after opening up with him. Um, Yaksha Mordov hurt him with a right hand. Then another. And though looked in very, very bad shape after he landed, uh, after Yaksha Mordov landed knee and about 10 uppercuts, looked on the way out. But he kind of got back. Um, Yaksha Mordov rushed it a little bit. Uh, and though he got a bit of life back, but then uh, Yasha Mordov tried to take down, failed, which is probably the best thing that ever happened to him because then he landed a counter jab. Uh, he was hurt hard, was undy. He knocked down and out very, very quickly, and that was uh, that was the end of it there. Um, you watch, like, I've watched Jacob Undy, and I've seen him wrestle, and I know his ability to wrestle. You watch Yasha Mordov in past fights, and you've seen him against Corey Anderson, he'd get dominated in the wrestling. Uh, I'm just wondering why you're not wrestling, like why you're not changing things up, why are you going out there with a guy you know hits very hard and f- striking with him, like take the path of least resistance here now, it's a guy who is, you know, basically undefeated, he lost one fight, but that was about five years before he started his actual career, um, I still think he's a top prospect, I still think he'll be back again, I still think he'll do good things, I could even see him winning a fight later on in the year, but uh, that was, that was a, a learning fight. Or one you should learn from. And if you don't learn from it, you'll never learn from it. Um, so, yeah, not great by him. But a brilliant performance from Yaksha Mordov. He put the hands on him that he needed to. The longer that fight went, it would have suited and die as well. So a brilliant finish and a brilliant win for 
Uh, yeah, Shimordov. Then we bring Primus versus uh, Bruno Miranda, and all I could think of a few minutes into this fight was this really suits Bryn Primus. A guy you can go in there with no... I, I feel like the elbows don't suit most people, but they suit Bryn Primus. Get the fight to the ground. Control it. Don't take much damage. Very good submissions. Oh, this this form... I could, honestly, uh, honestly, I have flashes went through me of Bryn Primus holding that million dollar check at the end of it. They really did. And he won't be a favourite or anything like that. But, um, yeah, this fight, nothing happened for the first minute. Um... Left hook to a takedown for Brent uh, was stopped. Then there was a clinch for a minute. Uh, trip takedown for Brent Primus. Um, is, it is Brent, isn't it? I went to a whole podcast before and called him Brett Primus. It's Brent. <laughs> I know it's Brent, but I, I have it in my head. Uh, anyway, uh, he got the trip takedown. Uh, uh, took the back almost, but he went into that, kind of that ride position. A couple of, happened a couple of times during the night. Uh, two hooks, then he did get the back. Rear naked choke, try... Uh, loads of less from Primus, high and low for the rest of the round, uh, and he won the round doing that. So not much happened. He took no damage in that round. Primus on top immediately after a couple of calf kicks, immediately took the back, and immediately got the rear naked choke in round number two. It only lasted a minute and 49 seconds. Uh, Bruno Miranda had no answer for him. The grappling was too much. Uh, he did well, to, uh, as I said, in the first round to defend it, but in the second round there was no answer. And Br- I'll tell you, Brent Primus is a live dog. A live dog in that. And you might think it, but I think he is. Um, didn't read the one decision of the night in a very good fight between Gadzi Radzabov and Solomon Rinfro. Um, the fight started off with a double jab from Rinfro. Um, Rinfro landed a lovely counter right hand after that. And he stopped the first takedown and landed a hard right hand. Um, a very fast left right combo from Rinfro. A very good start to it. And it was about three minutes in before um, uh, uh, Gadzi landed a shot, but then landed three hooks in a row. It was a big exchange. It was uh, Gadzi powers into a takedown, gets the back, but Rinfo bursts out of it immediately. So great start to the first round for uh, for Solomon Rinfo. Uh, low kick from Gadzi after he landed a right hand in, but Rin, uh, you know the le- latter half of the round, Rabadanov was doing uh, Rabadanov even was doing very very well. Uh, and Rinfro wasn't landing much. That was kind of a, a sign of things to come maybe a second round. Gadzi tries two takedowns, but they were no good. Nice jab and a leg kick uh, and a knee to the body from Gadzi. The pace was clearly slowing here from both of them, and that was very much suiting Rabadanov. Uh, Gadzi gets the clinch and lands some knees. Takedown, but Rinfro got up to the clinch. Um, Rinfro just, just landed nothing here. Uh, clinch strikes from Gadzi uh, from a stop takedown again. Rinfro was just... Looks so tired late and landed almost nodding in in that first second round. Sorry, so it was one one going into the third. Rinfro, bit of a second life to start the third. Um, he landed some jabs. There's a body kick from Rabzi, which was very 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 smart. Take a bit of that air out of him. Nice right hand from Rinfro. A takedown into side control from Gadzi in, and you know when there's a third round takedown after he stopped them for the first two rounds and it's tiredness coming into play. And that was exactly what it was here. Again, same as the last fight. He was going for the back, but he got into the, kind of the ride position. Didn't got the one hook. Didn't got the two hooks. Flattened him out. But Rinfro did very, very well to defend uh, from there. He kind of got his butt to the, the cage into um, into the clinch, but still, while still on the ground. But uh, Gadzi turned it over, got a body triangle, and stayed there for the last 90 seconds, landed punches from the back. So uh, a pretty uh, pretty easy fight to score there. Gadzi Rebzanov. Uh, uh, Rabadanov, Gadzi, Rabadanov won the last two rounds, 29-28 uh, but a good fight, a very good fight um, then we had the opening couple of fights of, of the night, very good fight, I enjoyed it between uh, Elvin Espinosa and Adam Piccolotti um, the judges had it two rounds to, to zero for Piccolotti but I actually thought Espinosa won the second but we'll get into here, um, Elvin clinched immediately uh, but Piccolotti ended up getting the takedown from an, a body lock, took the back Body triangle, but Elvin got out. Uh, he tried to guillotine, but Adam Piccolati landed on top again, took the back again. Uh, Elvin stood on him, but he was kind of still on his back and slammed. Uh, sorry, Piccolati, um, uh, yeah, uh, Piccolati stood and slammed Elvin's head. Uh, in, uh, sorry, Elvin stood and slammed Piccolati's head into the ground. Uh, Adam went for the triangle uh, to the Omoplata, in the Omoplata for ages. Uh, Espinosa kind of. 
needed a massive role to get back to his feet, which he did a few times during it. It was very, very uh, fun to watch. Um, landed a couple of shots, did uh, Espinosa before the, uh, the clinch and got out for the last 30 seconds. But then uh, Piccolotti went for a late kind of standing Kimura sweep into the mount. And that was a good way to finish the round for him. A cl- relatively close round again, the first, but I thought he uh, Piccolotti just about did enough. Both were thrown early in the second, but landed not much. Counter left from Elvin rocks uh, Adam. Um, uh, Piccolotti then tries to take down uh, kind of the halfway point after not much was landed, uh, but they both rise to the clinch. Nice knee from Piccolotti, and then there was more clinching again uh, as Elvin can uh, catch him in a body lock. Uh, Adam goes for the uh, the Kimura again. There was a lot of Kimuras. There was a lot of rolls from uh, Elvin uh, Espinosa back to his feet. And the, but there was a lovely right hand in from Elvin Espinosa. I thought that was the best shot of the round. And that's why I gave it to him. There was a bit of a clinch towards the end of the round. With Bo looking for position. It was fun, it was fun stuff against that clinch. It, it really, really was. Um, Piccolotti lands some nice strikes. Uh, and he clinched again. It was him that clinches this time instead of Espinosa. Lovely knee to the body from Espinosa. Nice dirty boxing from Espinosa again. Uh, but Piccolotti answered back with some two. Including one right hand. But then Elvin came in. Flew inside, flying knee up through the middle and put him out of there with an absolutely beautiful, short, flying knee uh, inside and knocked out Adam Piccolotti. Had been two, officially two rounds down on the judges' cards uh, at uh, 2 minutes 23 of the uh, the third round. Absolutely lovely finish there from Elvin Espinosa. And in the opening fight of the night in the heavyweight division, uh, it was between Marcelo Nunes and Jordan Heidemann. And I truly believe here that Marcelo Nunes was just given up position so he could get a, a, a submission. And it worked for him. Uh, so to start off the fight, Heidemann was looking really good on the feet. Really good, looked clean. Uh, was throwing nice jabs and right hands. Now, he didn't land many of them, but he was looking good. He missed the big right hand, which I think would have, if it had got Nunes, it would have been big trouble. Nunes got the clinch, got a takedown, and then took the back. And from there was big issues. Um... Uh, Heidemann uh, was able to quickly get out but Nun- uh, Nunes scrambled to the top and this is what I'm talking about kind of giving him enough rope to hang himself type of a thing um, Nunes is making it awkward by kind of squeezing his head when he got onto the mountain I know pushing his face against the mat um, again Heidemann got away but I truly believe he was set up so Nunes could catch him in the triangle which he did then moved to the armbar and got the submission with that armbar. Uh, beautiful, beautiful jiu-jitsu. And I really, like, this This is how jiu-jitsu works going forward. We don't see many submissions anymore. You're going to have to attack. You're going to have to give people the opportunities to move, to open up the submissions. Um, and that's exactly what Marcelo Nunes did here. And uh, he moves on. I did. It's not a tournament fight, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I'm sure... Uh, I'm sure he didn't do himself any anything bad anyway with uh, with that win there. So very good stuff for uh, for Marcelo Nunes. All right, that's it. Let me just uh, recap uh, all of the results before I let you go. Impa Kasang and I defeated Alex Palizzi uh, by a first round uh, knockout. Um, Tom Breeze lost to Rob Wilkinson with a first round knockout as well. It was a second round knockout for Clay Collard over Patricky Pitbull. Uh, Michael Dufour submitted Mads Burnell amazingly with a guillotine in the second round. There was a TKO via finger injury for Joshua Silvera over Sadabu C. Shoeface Antonio Carlos Jr. knocked out, or, or sorry, submitted Simon Biong on a rear naked choke in round one. It was a in round one knockout for Dolcian Yashimurdov. I, I learned how to say that name so well before. Dolcian Yashimurdov, Yashimurdov, uh, against Jacob Indoy. Um, TKO first round. Brain premise submitted. Bruno Miranda with a rear neck choke in the second. There was a unanimous decision for Gabzi Ridzivanov against Solomon Rinfro. Elvin Espinosa uh, knocked out Adam Piccolotti with a third round flying knee. And there was a first round armbar for uh, Marcelo Nunes against Jordan Heiderman to kick off the show. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that, if you enjoyed last week's shows, there will be a preview out during the week for next week's third event of the PFL season check that out as well and keep it locked to Sherdog.com for absolutely everything else thank you very much for tuning in my name is Sean Sheen for Sherdog.com and I'll see you all next time